we get to the uh, or to the lesson because we're into something we we need to uh, go deep into because um, last time we discussed what was happening after 1600. Now the prize, the economic prize of the Europeans, the Caribbean Islands, North and South America, is beginning to yield enough economic gain to start competition among the European powers for space in the new world. Remember, all of the North American continent is not the United States. So there's competition among European powers, not only for space on the North American continent, there's competition among some European powers for space in what is now the United States. In the, the United States wasn't settled solely by English. Spanish settlement in Florida, they were pushed out in the French settlement that we talk about the consequences of later on in this competition for space in the lucrative Caribbean Islands between England and this competition in Africa itself for who will control what part and the British having the greatest amount of muscle is beginning to push the lesser powers around, especially the Scandinavians who are a long way from home and that whose supply line is so thin and so far away from home, they're in a poor position to defend themselves. But a comparatively little people, little and numerically, but shrewd in the colonial game and one of the most ruthless slave traders in the business are the Dutch. These wooden shoe wearing people, these two lip blowing people, these people whose homes are so clean they were named a cleanser after them was one of the great spillers of blood in the slave trade. And if you want to read a book that is an absolute revelation in the conduct of the slave trade and under different colonial powers, Read Sahara Johnson's The Negro in the New World and read his chapter on the Africans under the Dutch. Read the whole book. Read the whole book because the whole book is worth reading. See, one thing and that has caused a lot of students to rob themselves of a lot of information now, they would just slap the name Colonial Vigor on Sir Harry Johnson. See, he was a white supremacist and a Colonial Vigor. And factually, they would be right. But if you miss reading Sir Harry Johnson, 
you have missed some major information. This white supremacist and this colonial bigot was a master researcher and he could write well. His analysis, or almost a catalog of what slaves were brought to the new world, what slaves it was advisable not to have brought at all, the fighting tribes, the tribes who came, <laughs> pretended peacefulness until they kind of got the lay of the land and fought later. Those you had to watch. See, you watch those Europeans, you know, they hang around for years until they see an opening. And they, they don't never fight at once. But that being the, the candle bomb, sometimes he hit you right away. But the Europeans would pretend meekness. Until he catch you on guard. He would he, he outlined the fighting spirit of different ones at different places. And different ones, it was advisable not to have war at all. Orlando Patterson, Jamaican sociologist, now at Harvard, went over some of the same material drawing different conclusions in his book, The Sociology of Slavery, and may have attempted to bring this up to date in his last book, The Social Death of Slavery. But Sahara Johnson, supposed to have been that Englishman who knew more about Africans than any man alive. Now while that wasn't so, it's an exaggeration and an overstatement of his talent. The one thing that he did know, he cataloged, he knew how to catalog the categories of Africans brought into the Americas and in the Caribbean islands in such a way that you can study the temperament, almost the temperature of that culture by Sahara Johnson. But he also wrote another work that you would deprive yourself of a whole lot of information by not reading. The Colonization of Africa by Alien Race by alien races. Now, but the book, the main book, which I have extracted a lot of information, which deals with what I'm talking about tonight, is really his, the Negro in the New World, and the impact of Africans in the economic making of the New World and different colonial powers trying to deal with these different temperaments of Africans in these different plantation systems and the plantation system as a separate cultural way of life, a non-cultural way of life, but as a separate way of life that Gilberto Fire, the, the Portuguese, the uh, Brazilian historian has said, called a separate civilization. In his work, masterpieces except for his concept of the Nile slave trade. See, if you can live through his concept of the Nile slave trade and read the masters and the slaves and the shanties and the mansions and other works about Gilbert of Friday, but if you can live through that, the fact that there was no such thing as a mild slave, slave trade. 
he assumes that the mob. He assumes that the mulatto woman in Brazil was as close, got as close to heaven as women got on earth because many times the mulatto women in Brazil, after the arrival of the white woman, were treated even better. That means he don't know what better consists of. She was the prize as the concubine and the mistress. But nobody married her. All the rich planters had one. It was the style of the day to have one, and to have one in a house, with, sometimes with servants. She had a carriage. But she had, she had no legal status. She couldn't make any demands on anyone. And if her master died, she couldn't demand any portion of his property. But his legal wife, who tolerated in his relationship with her, when he died, she got the plantation. But the mistress got nothing except for he had given her in his, in his lifetime. But Gilberto Fryer is of the opinion that this woman rose higher in the societies of Brazil and might well have been the maker of Brazilian society and the epitome of Brazilian society. Because many times these planters who come to the ball and introduce their mistresses before they introduce their wives. They did the same thing in New Orleans. Even had balls, Creole and octoroon balls, where they would dress and parade their concubine mistresses, mixed breeds, even sent to Paris with special dress for them. There's a whole octoroon society. This is the origin of the, of the Louisiana Creole. A subject not worth a great deal here and now, but it was a separate society, so separate from blacks that it was a long time, even up to the present, men and women go to school with blacks and couldn't go to school with whites. It presented a, an educational dilemma for the school system. Now, what we are dealing with now, not only the competition between these colonial powers, we're dealing with the making of the new world structure that, the remaking of a people psychologically and physically. And when you talk about slavery and the Africans in the world, no one talks about the, the fact that here is an African people that in order to manage them, they had not only to break the will of so many of them, they had to bastardize them in large numbers and turn the bastards against certain factions and create fear and suspicion one against the other in order to weaken the concept of revolutions and use one to spy on the other. Now this was effective in the West Indies and effective in parts of South America. This same system was not effective in the United States. Because in the United States, the crude slave master, who still crude in the same way, put all the color gradations in one bag, shook them up, and put one name on the back. You know what the name is, so I need not repeat it. So the lightest of the lights, the almost whites, if they were poor, stood next door to the blackest of the blacks. 
happen in the United States. But in other places, they got certain privileges. I'm not saying they didn't get privileges in the United States, but they got a different kind of privilege. They got privileges in college, and they got privileges in the fraternities, and the sororities, and the local societies. But such privileges that they got in Brazil, and such privileges they got in Jamaica, almost a separate society, separate neighborhood, separate job categories. The privileges they got in ruin Haiti to this very day. They didn't get that kind of privilege in the United States. And yet, when the United States occupied Haiti, the United States played on that scenario left by the French to rule Haiti, the period of American colonialism in Haiti. You probably forgot that America occupied Haiti by 1915, it didn't lead to 1934. And that America ruled the country for putting these gradations of color once again, one against the other, far more ruthlessly than they've ever done here in the United States. Because in the United States, America has not cared too much about putting colors out. They have a legend, they, they just since some of the light skinned one is they there's the lunch of black one. So long as one declared declared one. Now, we're talking about the making and the remaking of the people, but the main thing we're talking about is economic competition between European powers for space that will yield them the profit to rebuild and strengthen the economy of Europe and lay the foundation for the modern world. And that the plantation system could not have been built in Europe because Europe hadn't got the land. And if Europe had the labor, the labor could not have been used quite that way. Because the labor used in the feudal system of Europe was not as productive as the labor used in the plantation system of the New World. And the Europeans did try to enslave Europeans and did bring Europeans to the New World in large numbers and work them without any appreciable success. But in the United States, they had more success with a variation of work because of a variation of climate. Now I'm coming to 1916-19 because we're dealing with the 1600s in the aftermath. Because 1619, when Africans arrived in the United States, brought to the United States, they found that the larger number of indentured servants were white, and some were Indian. And the whites were mostly Irish, some Central European, but mostly Irish. Poor Europeans, some Scandinavian, who, had, who did not have the price of paying their way to the U.S and who <coughs> got on boats and who, for the price of passage, the captain had the option 
optioning their labor off. And so the people who were purchasing their labor literally had to pay the passage. We had to work for that person for a number of years to pay off the passage. These were indentured servants as against chattel slaves. And that when they arrived and the Africans began to commingle with them and had, there was no objection to relationships one to the other, which tells us something which a whole lot of bigots in this country would like to forget. That the whole concept of prejudice and separation based on color had a hard time getting started in this country because it didn't make sense to people of the same class in the same predicament who had the same enemy in the same oppressor. So it didn't make sense for them to fight against each other or separate themselves from each other, having the same common oppressor and the same common enemy. Now, in the West Indies, a similar thing happened then in, in Barbados, that some descendants of the poor Irish, called Johnny Redlegs, still in Barbados, and why they didn't make much out of themselves, I'll never know. But if you ever saw a group of white people that you wanted to kind of sympathize with. Well, I don't know why they didn't. You wonder why they didn't put themselves up by their bootstraps and who stole their boots? <laughs> I'll be there. Probably didn't have any boots. But the giant red legs in Barbados is about the most pathetic. You've never seen it all your life. <laughs> you feel like making a contribution to it. <laughs> to his cause. <laughs> and, uh, and a few times then, you know, Bob Asian lady married Johnny Red Day, they tell her to shake your head, take the head and say, well, poor girl, she couldn't do no better. <laughs> you know, a lot of people pity it. Because these were poor whites who didn't work their way up to nothing. And whose descendants in Barbados to this day are still depressed and still poor. While in America, the poor whites did work their way out of it, did work their way up to, up to something. The, many of the Irish became slave drivers, managers, or, or petty something or another. Anyway, they did work their way out of their predicament. But in the West Indies, a lot of the poor English Lot of the poor English overused that privilege, drank too much, gambled too much, now with excess to more women than they ever had in their life, not in a position to resist. Some of them partook of that temptation too much. Someone could have told them, you might as well try to drink all the water in the sea. They didn't know that. And the passing, the passing of that group of petty craftsmen from England brought over to fix things on the plantation, basic mechanics. The passing of that group brought into being some skilled slave labor blacksmiths, wagon masters, people who would fix the machinery on the sugar plantation. This is the origin of the Caribbean freeman. Because the black American freeman would come into being about the same time and about the same way, but not exactly for the same reason. 
the slaves in New England were not used the year round. The winters were long. There wasn't enough for him to do the year round, so he became an industrial slave. Those who were working in industry, worked at carpentry, developed a, a, a paying skill. The master general rented them out. If a slave was a good company, he could make, he could make four dollars a day. So the master would rent him out. He would take three. Let him have one of them. So a slave sometimes could make enough money to buy his own freedom in, in a year. And if he saved his dollar, you know, he, you know a few dollars, he, 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 then and he could purchase his freedom and because of the pressure of the Quaker, because the Quakers were propagating against slavery anyway. And so that moral pressure made it a little easier to purchase. And sometimes the Quakers gave him the additional money he would need to purchase his freedom. So now you've got Caribbean free men, black American free men. In South America, you've got free men, the relatives of the black woman who married the Portuguese in the church of greed, that once she married the Portuguese, she is free. And some of her relatives became free, used as laborers in the hinterlands of Brazil, and some of them escaped, for free by virtue of escape. Now, you've got a class of Africans in South America, in the West Indies, and the U.S. We're going to have to deal with later on because they're going to be thinkers. In Brazil, out of this class, will come two emperors, Pedro I, Pedro II. Mixed breed rulers of Brazil. Out of it will also come the father of Brazilian literature, Emmanuel Diasis. And from Peru, another part of South Africa, will come the first, maybe the only saint of African descent canonized in the New World, Father Martin de Porres. So now you see the results of, now I'm not praising the mixing, I'm not judging the mixing, I'm not saying it was good or bad, I'm saying that out of it came certain personalities who would play a role in changing the status of Africans in the new world. All of this was happening, which meant nothing of a consequence to the colonial powers fighting for space, competing with each other for space in Africa and in the Caribbean islands. The greatest producer of net economic gain other than Africa. Africa's production of net economic gain would be the slave itself. The Caribbean's producer of net economic gain would be the products from the plantation system that is now beginning to feed Europe and begin to profit, you begin to profit from it. Now, sugar is beginning to be a marketable product. The leather 
from the cows, etc. The mahogany, to make the most had a large mahogany forest, it's been easily to the point now, but Jamaica has a law against cutting, cutting mahogany. And, and, and the law will stay intact for 20 years to give the trees a chance to grow back. But Brazil had a, still had a large mahogany forest. We we'll had it long because the Americans are there now cutting like fools, not planting nothing. Haiti once had a large mahogany forest with the diversity of wood that Europeans needed. Furniture. And the British brought, brought over a lot of furniture from England and the uh, termites in the New World just used that, ate that furniture for dessert. The wood was so soft, you know, they just smacked their lips on that. And so the Africans had to take local wood and reproduce that furniture because the termites just having a holiday eating up that eating up that salt wood. And if you go to Jamaica today, you will see some of the furniture that they made replicas of the British furniture that came over. And I've gone to a home in Jamaica. Someone pointed to a bed and said, my great grandfather was born on that bed. My father was born on that bed. I was born in that bed. And you could put a truck on that bed, it was so strong. Good mahogany. Mahogany the leg, mahogany the side, mahogany everything. But Jamaica had plenty of good mahogany at the time. This is before they cut it down so fast until today you, you can't even cut mahogany at all in, in Jamaica. We're talking about African craftsmen now working and reproducing. I mean, producing replicas of British furniture. We're not talking about raw labor. We're talking about skilled craftsmen. And many of these Africans were skilled craftsmen and wood, wood workers before they were captured as slaves. A fact that too many people overlook. They think this is brought some raw people grunting words nobody could understand. To the new world came a whole lot of skillful people, including iron workers, who revolutionized the, the iron works. A lot of beautiful iron work in New Orleans, most of the time, most of the grill work, the fences, and you know, the fine iron work on the porches in New Orleans. A lot of it's being taken down, some of it being preserved for museums. Now all of this is happening outside of Africa. So within Africa itself, there is resistance and the continuation of slavery. Africa is still being drained of slaves. The Portuguese having fought in Zinga and in Zinga having fought and lost, they have taken, they've taken over Angola. <laughs> Remember now, you've got two Portuguese slave trades. One takes care of Lisbon, right in the Portuguese. The other slave trade is taking care of the needs of Brazil, where you have a group of Portuguese who pulled away from the mother country and who needs slaves for the Brazilian market as against the general Portuguese market. Now the Portuguese who's taken slaves from the East Coast in partnership with the Arabs, they are selling and reselling. They are dumping some of their slaves into the British market, a lot to the Arab markets going to the east. Now, if you understand the early Arab slave trade, 
starting in the 600s. But you've got to go even further back if you understand that Hatshepsut started a relationship between Asia, China, India, then I think called Kamei, 1500 BC, and this is all documented with information on the items that the Chinese took out of Africa and the inf and information on what the Africans bought from the Chinese. And <laughs> that is a little book on the last phase of this trade called the Paracas of the Algerian Sea, written by a Greek gazetteer. And this tells you what was for sale all down the coast of East Africa and the Red Sea ports of the Chinese all along this coast. Now when you go to a book like Anacalypsis and read about African-looking, dark-skinned emperors on the throne of China, now it will make a little sense. Now, how they got there, I don't know. Began to be taken to China and India during that period. So now, but that's not what I'm really talking about. I'm trying to get to after 1600 and the competition between European and European that's going to lead to a change in the method of trading that's going to be really a preface to another form of slavery that we have to deal with. And that's going to be colonialism. Because chattel slavery itself is going to be going to become top headed and the change is going to come not because anybody loves anybody. It's going to come because it's going to reach a saturation point. It's going to reach a point where everybody's going to have one who wanted one, or could afford one. And then the village will start the campaign to get rid of the traffic at sea, then the British abolitionists, Wilberforce, Granville Shaw, who get quick reputation, fighting the end of slave trade. The people would think they're humanitarians, and they're not, because neither one of them fought against child labor in England. Neither one of them fought against the abuse of women in England. Neither one of them fought against the fact that women were an England picked up off the street and then they brought to America to be auctioned off to the men in America who, because there was an oversupply of men and a shortage of women. And in the Westwood movement, most of the men When there was an extreme shortage of women, they were brought to the early trade moving to, to the West. Women were just brought for that purpose, to be the wives or the mates of, of those men at the end of the train, train drive and at the end of the trails, the, the cattle drive trails and literally auction off, just like you auction off how much in a bit. Once the story of the United States is told, once the story of servitude is told, and once the story of what happened to the female in America, black, white, and otherwise, 
I think you're going to have a women's little movement that might make a whole lot of people run for cover. Because her deal has been rather, rather sad. But be that as it may, what we're trying to get to is that competition between these slaveholders and look at slavery as a labor system is now making them reconsider the structure of the system. And the rebellions are costing so much that to a great extent, it is not worth it. Brazil generally left out of the history of rebellions. Brazil, more than Haiti, gave the greatest example of African self-assertion and state building in the new world and in bringing into being the Colombos, the African independent communities in the new world after and in and around the Republic of Palmyra almost a hundred years before the American Revolution. Bahia would not last as long and its fight, though he wrote, would not be as he wrote. But that too came before the American Revolution. But at the tip end of South America, another series of revolts that what Higgins called the Bush Negro Revolts. And the, and the best known, the longest fall of these revolts coming again before the American Revolution is the Burbish Revolt, the Dunbar River, what is now Guyana from the British Guiana. Here you have a slave revolt when a house slave, Kofi, saw his wife, a field slave, beaten to death and held his position held his peace, and this act so affected him that he saw the true tragic nature of slavery and set a revolt in motion along with another field servant named Uncle. Here is the first time you see a slave revolt where a field servant and a house servant is working hand to hand, although they argued a lot, they did work together. And Kofi would set this revolt in motion and almost in a show of vengeance against what he let happen to his wife he married again an escaped slave from one of the plantations, a woman who was a field slave who escaped. They wrote her master and say, come and get her and prepare to spill blood because I will not yield. And each time he wrote his former master, who kept asking him to yield and to give up the land that he had taken, 
he would write them back, stating he would not. But sign all of his letters, never again to be a slave. This revolt was against the Dutch, and it lasted so long the Dutch could get communications to Holland and the whites, the local whites had yielded and begged for mercy. And he wasn't defeated until communications came, heavy ammunition and soldiers. The revolt lasted for oh, almost three years. Finally, defeat, but when you think of the time of this revolt and, and the success that he had in spite of the lack of modern ammunition, modern equipment of any kind, and that people would write the history of revolution and would leave this aspect completely out out of history. Now, while this revolt at the tip end of South America, the revolt in Suriname, known as the Bush Negro Revolt, and the revolt in Guyana, or the Barbies Revolt, would be the best known. Well, not the only ones in, in South America. The revolts in uh, Venezuela, other parts of uh, South America. In fact, there's a whole book on the uh, Venezuelan abolitionist movement. Then there's excellent research on the Brazilian abolitionist movement. But if you think that even this plastic, this uh, Cosmetic change. And I maintain now that what you call emancipation was a cosmetic change in the slave system before converting it into colonialism. But if you think even this cosmetic change came about out of the goodness of anyone's heart, then you're misreading history. That change came about because African men, African women stood up and opposed that system for over a hundred years physically and in some cases destroyed it and threatened the entire plantation system which was the very economy of Europe, outside of Europe, they had built an economy feeding and contributing to the re recovery of Europe. All of this was threatened by the self-assertion of these Africans. And they had to make a move. And they went through the motions of liberation with a fakery called emancipation, but they would convey this into another form of slavery called colonialism that was more manageable. So the change after 1600 would be only a cosmetic change toned down revolts. It toned down revolts, but it did not stop revolts. But that would write the preface to, to today's revolts. These and the larger and the more meaningful and more political revolts that would come in the 19th century, but there's some more work to be done 
in explaining the 18th century and the personalities, black, white, and otherwise, that led up and that participated in the 18th century, because the 18th century was the century of monumental black abolitionists, some true white abolitionists, and when a reading and writing class had emerged in the West Indies, in the United States, and in Africa itself. I'm now a little freer and I'm now making more demands, demands that, that mothers and them in that position is also a part of Western social thought. All of these things now will come together in the 18th, which will lead to the 19th, which I have a good sense the fighting century for African people all over the world. And I have often called the greatest century of African people outside of Africa, the century that we have to live again in order to understand the 20th and make the 21st. Because until we understand that 19th, we will not understand that in the 20th century, we actually slowed down. And we're going to make the 21st. We don't really have to go back and study the men and the women of the 19th. And over the last week, I have been focusing and on the... Depending how you want to look at them, how you want to take them, what time, and whether you understand the environment and the condition that shaped each one and made each one the way he was, given the circumstances and the time that their life unfolded. And remember, Du Bois lived almost a century himself, and he straddled so many ages, and he rode the tide of those ages. He wrote it exceptionally well, making changes with it, like a man riding a tiger, keeping his original strength, and reaching out for the wisdom of age all at the same time. He was the intellectual master. And we have to go back to that well and drink the pure water of intelligence and understand that, but don't ever put one over the other, don't ever prefer one to the other, but take each one based on his individual contribution. And remember that each one of those men was saying the same thing, but using different words based on how environment and condition shaped them to do and say what they did. But we will get to the 19th because maybe the greatest thing the 19th did was to be the antecedents of those men in the 20th century. Everything relates to everything and all history is connected one way, one way or the other. That's going a little too far ahead because we just finished the 16th going into the 17th because the 17th century and the 18th century might have been the most tragic and difficult century for the slave trade and the slave and the slaves because out of it would produce a caliber of research that will make the slave traders reassess and reconsider their position. And this reconsideration would lead to the fakery called emancipation. And this fakery in turn 
will lead to another managerial system which they call colonialism. And we haven't finished with colonialism to this day. And that the European is always searching for a managerial system that will make it possible for him to extract labor, goods and services from a large number of people to keep grist constantly feeding into his mills at a reasonable or at a very cheap cost. When he has to pay reasonable prices for all of this, he will have to readjust his, his, his economic system altogether. And this he don't intend to do. So now if I keep on talking, you will understand the stubbornness to yield South Africa. Maybe the people of Bolivia want to know why Western dominance of the tin mines. The Mexico might bring up the question of the oil again. And this is going to lead to an international question once South Africa goes, because the best developed method of extracting and using the middle wealth of Africa has been developed in South Africa. And most of these, these methods, most of these methods goes into Western industry. And without them, Western industry would have to change its whole method. And if they ever have to pay for it, pay top price for it, other than to get it from the cheap price that they're now getting, they will have to make a drastic economic change. So Western nations in general, left or right, do not really want South Africa to fall. And this might surprise you. This might also include socialist nations. Europe is Europe. And do not think racism stops at the door of communism and socialism. Unless you've got illusions. Racism is racism. Europe is Europe. They are clear about it. If there's any confusion, it's your confusion. Any illusion, it's your illusion. They are clear about what they want. They want to dominate the world forever. <laughs> You've got confusion about partnership and, and unite and, you know, humanity. You've got that dream of Christian brotherhood and Martin Luther King. Do you know Christian ethic? He said it so beautiful. <laughs> you didn't even think he believed it. But you got to, you got to live with nobody. Who else do you see propagating? Anybody other than King propagating it? Jesse Jackson. Well, no, no, I mean, other than us and company. <laughs> Judo Christian ethic. With the dual Christian ethics, they got us into the slave trade. <laughs> Those are the ones who went over there and captured us. All right, the, that's enough. Um, we, we should have some discussion about it now. If I hope we're going to go to I'll use up the time anyway. Thank you, Aaron. We have five minutes. All right, then let's use five minutes. I have a question. When uh, black a uh, free man from the Caribbean entered the stage of uh, becoming uh, blacksmiths, etc. Were they able at times to escape if they wanted to do that at all towards the United States? But they not only did, but they came in some numbers 
came to the United States and settled. And some started organizations. One opened, one edited a newspaper. One started a lodge, the Black Masonic Order. The, we called the African Lodge at Prince Hall, Barbados. Lebron Bennett's book, Pioneers uh, of Protest. It's a very good portrait of Prince Hall. There's a new book on it by Charles Wesley, but it's hard to get. And some of my academic friends visit my house, and they, I don't know what kind of pockets they got, but the book left with one of them. I told Charles Wesley's wife, who just had a daughter photo, who happened to be a very good friend of mine, has gotten a second copy. I just hid that one. So when they come, that one's under something. <laughs> but there's a, there is a good book on it. There's a Peter Ogden from Antigua who started the Odd Fellows. I mean, a lot of them came to the U.S. The Caribbean miners had his, some of his finest flowerings away from home and in the United States. One of the great unsung heroes of the Caribbean that most Caribbeans don't even know about is, is our, uh, Hubert Harrison. Barely finished high school. So brilliant, he taught at Columbia University and Henry George School. And Columbia University didn't want to admit that a, an unlettered street speaker from Harlem was teaching, so they put him down as handyman and paid him as a handyman. But he was teaching in Columbia, economics, and all kinds of subjects. He paid as a handyman. Well, several books called One When Africa Awakens, awakens we're reading right now. It's far ahead of, it's thinking, it's far ahead of some of the people right now. He died about 1927. Hubert Harrison, he is the man that really introduced Marvel's Bible to his first large audience. I thought you spoke on last week you started to lay out the approaches of the three men in the life of the century that you should study with uh, uh -huh. Washington, uh, uh, the Boris and uh, Gabi. You talked about one of them, but could you talk about the other two? Talk spoke briefly on Washington. This approach to the uh, No, I mean see Washington, I was briefly Washington. Uh, concept was to feed yourself, house yourself, and clothe yourself, and sustain yourself. And Du Bois' concept was to protect yourself politically, and that an education is supposed to make you aspire to be anything from a good street speaker to the president. And Garvey's concept was the reclamation of Africa and the unification of African people and the redemption of Africa throughout the whole world. And his, all of them thought of nation management and preparation for nation management. They were all dreamers along different lines. And they were all saying the same thing. Only God would put it in more graphic words at the end of a large number of his speeches. Up, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. And he was a great one at building confidence. And he understood something which so many people do not understand to this day. That to oppress a people, you must first destroy their self-confidence and historical memory. And they forget what they have been. They're confused about what they are. And they're not too clear about what they still have to be. Then you don't have to build any prisons for them, really. Because you've got them in one, psychologically. More binding than any walls can possibly hold them. 
Isn't that the, the concept of, uh, isn't that the theory behind uh, canonicalism? That is the theory of canonicalism. Yeah. Not only behind canonicalism, it is the theory of canonicalism. Make you think you're nothing but a nothing. The first thing to make you laugh at your, they laugh at your gods. The next achievement is to make you laugh at your gods. Then you change gods, take their gods, their dress, their food taste. Then what else do they need from you? Um, you are totally trapped. You got their gods, their image. Sipping tea at four. You never taste tea in your damn life, don't even like tea. <laughs> yeah, because they sip it at four, you sip it at four. <laughs> they don't, in, don't need to be in the prisons after that. I've seen Africans in, in all that climate with tweed on. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody going around in Africa with tweed? And a tie. I'm going to school with a frock tail coat and a wing collar. Just because the English did that in England. Who needs a prison after that? You got your mind. John Dubey, a great South African, that was his relative who had the problem in Sunnybrook. A lot of people quite forget that that was the relative of the great John Dubé who really built the ANC original. People who don't study enough history. That was the grand nephew of John Dubé. They didn't grant his tenure. Huh? They didn't grant his tenure. No. And he didn't do much. He just said his eyes. Would he lie? No. No. Did the um, English-speaking world um, have parliamentary democracy prior to embarking on colonialism, or was it a hand-in-hand? The, the English... Well, the, the parliamentary system in England and France, that evolved, that was in place prior to uh, the big years of the slave trade, wasn't it? Well, they was concurrently came into being concurrent with with that mean having parliamentary democracy at home and behaving in a different way away from home is no contradiction for them because the people away from home are not considered human beings anyway. Well, I mean, was that is that the sole rationale, the subhumanity of the others? Well, it's not the sole rationale, but it, it is. It is the fact that they have not, in their mentality, elevated the people to the point of thinking that the people deserve equal consideration with them on a human level, or that the people are capable of handling the so parliamentary system. It's the greed that justifies the labeling of subhuman, the, the yeah. desire to exploit yeah. is rationalized by mm. the label of subhuman. Yeah. Backed up by Christian theology. It's not backed up by Christian theology.